All right, so before we get started, I just have a few quick questions I always like to ask people before I ever give a talk like this. First one being, since we're at a BSD conference, everybody who uses OpenBSD, raise your hand. Everybody who uses NetBSD, raise your hand. What? Nobody? Uh, DragonflyBSD. And FreeBSD. Other. You. <laughs> OK. Um, so I just generally like to do lots of little quick polls with people right before I talk. Usually I do the, give these kinds of talks at Linux conferences where nobody's ever heard of BSD. So I have to kind of explain what it is. So I always have to explain, OK, what FreeBSD is and how it's descended. That's fine. Since we're at a BSD conference, though, I can be a little more specific. So I, I assume most of you have heard about TrueOS before. Am I correct in that? Yes? Yes? OK. Other hands. Um, how many of you have not heard about TrueOS? Good. I don't need to explain myself then. Oh, wait a minute. Do you? OK. You're good? OK. So I don't need to go into too much detail. I mean, I'll give you a little bit of detail in here, but I don't have to go into gory details or whatever if you're already familiar with it. Um, how many of you have actually used TrueOS at one point? All right. How many of you use TrueOS right now at, your present at the present time? OK. How many of you ever used PCBSD? A few of you. OK, good. That gives me a rough ballpark of what kind of audience we've gotten. Now, how many of you are interested in TrueOS but haven't heard any of the recent developments? OK, like the stuff that happened, what was it, yesterday? Two days ago? Yeah, the blog post that came out a couple days ago. Are any of you familiar with that already? Yes? No? OK. Well, I do go into a little bit more details on that at the end of this talk, because this is kind of what this talk was going into, is why what was announced is actually what's going, where we're going going forward. So this will lead into that and explain the background of the project and why we're going, and where we've been heading, and just haven't told people until now. <laughs> That's always fun. So. And just for my own benefit, completely unrelated to that stuff, uh, how many of you use the Lumina desktop? One of you. Oh, a few of you. How many of you used it within the last month? OK, a lot more of you. Good. Now, are you using, those of you that are using it, are you using the latest uh, release version on FreeBSD, which I think is 1.4.0? Or are you tracking the newer uh, releases from the source repo, which I think is 1.4.3 at the moment? FreeBSD packages, OpenBSD packages, yeah. OK, that's kind of what I expected. 1803 TrueOS. Yeah, I think that one's a little older. That's 141, I think. All right. Sorry, I'm try I've got two minutes. I'm trying to kill time. <laughs> Anyone know any jokes? <laughs> I tried to be a comedian, but everybody just laughed at me. Yeah. <laughs> That'll get you every time. Yeah, almost there. <laughs> Does anybody know how the recording system works? Because I heard that it was supposed to be recorded, but do I have to stand like okay, right so, here? No, it's taken from the, you got the mic on it? I've got the mic. Yeah, yeah. it's taken through that. That will get recorded through the college system. There's also a webcam right there. Oh, this one. Which is streaming live as we speak. So I need to stand over here so yeah, people can see the fun. slides? Or over there? OK. They're not recorded. OK. So do you want me to like stand over there out of the corner or something? Like, 
over here. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. So if I'm in the corner, hopefully I'm not covering the slide. Yeah, yeah that's true. I should probably post them somewhere then, shouldn't I? <laughs> I'll try and stand. I'll try and stand here. I tend to pace, but I will try to remain fixed. And that took the, took, well, and that took the rest. The that took the rest of the time. So, all right. Welcome to my talk. This is the True OS difference. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with me, I'm Ken Moore. I work on the True OS project. I was part of the PCBSD project back in the day. I was one of the founding members of True OS when we made the name switch, and. Here to talk to you a little bit about it, shore up some things that people might be confused about, you know, enlighten people that weren't aware of things. So this is just a quick, very rough outline of what we're just going to go over today. I'm going to try and do a very quick history of TrueOS just to give you all the context of why we do things differently than FreeBSD and why we've decided to focus on these differences. Um, then we'll go into changes from FreeBSD because TrueOS is based off of FreeBSD itself, but we change a number of things, and so I'll go into some of those. And then I want to go into some of the next steps, stuff that was mentioned in the release announcement a couple days ago, and go into, with all this context, I think a lot of that will start to make a lot more sense for why we're changing directions. So first off, PCBSD. A number of you said you were familiar with it, had even used it, so I hopefully don't need to go into too much detail on this. But it was started in 2005 by Chris Moore, who is my older brother, it's not me. Um, and he started it in 2005 as a desktop focused version of FreeBSD release. And the original version of PCBSD was based off of FreeBSD 6.0. Uh, he gradually started creating and adding utilities to PCBSD at the time, specifically for shoring up some of the weaknesses. PCBSD was based off of KDE3, so he created a new network manager in QT3 to go along with KDE because the KDE network manager wasn't working properly with FreeBSD, things like that. So eventually, he created some utilities such as PC Sysinstall, which is a scriptable installer for FreeBSD rather than the text installer. Um, PC Net Manager is the network manager I mentioned a moment ago, and there's a number of other ones. All of the utilities that he created for PCBSD were submitted back to FreeBSD as ports. I believe most of them appeared in the sysutils category, and they were all PCBSD dash something in the ports tree. Gradually, he started delving into adding and customizing the FreeBSD ports themselves on a regular basis because he discovered that many of the ports, the build options for the ports, were not designed for desktops. Like they had all the graphical stuff turned off, and then when you run it from the desktop, you wonder why things don't work properly. So he had to start building his own ports tree and building his own packages with different flags turned on just so it would integrate properly. So he started maintaining a fork of the FreeBSD ports tree. I joined on the team a little bit later after that, and PCBSD kept going till the 10 series, FreeBSD 10. And then in end of 2015, very beginning of 2016, we decided to make the plunge. We had always been based off of FreeBSD releases for PCBSD. But then we started, it's like, you know what? Every time FreeBSD release comes out, we would determine that it was already at least a year or two obsolete for modern laptops. It would never work with stuff with, that had come out within the previous year or two. So since we were based on releases, even though something was brand new for us it, to the rest of the community and the consumers, it felt like, oh, that's old news. It doesn't work on anything new. So we started rolling builds of PCBSD using FreeBSD Current instead of FreeBSD Release Branch. Um, so by, I think it was December of 2015, so I put the end of 2015 there, but by the, the end, by December of 2015, we actually had a rolling build of FreeBSD Current at the time, publishing pre-release images of FreeBSD 11.0 from the current tree. As part of this move to Current, though, we also started using some new systems in FreeBSD, which were planned and scheduled by the FreeBSD team for release in 11.0. Namely, package base. 
So this is something that FreeBSD still doesn't have in the 11 series, and they're still talking about whether it's going to get put into FreeBSD 12 or not. But PCBSD, or TrueOS, has been using package base for almost two years now. We've actually been using it and testing it and committing fixes to it right back to FreeBSD. Um, at the same time, though, uh, Joe Maloney came on board at the TrueOS project, and he was very, very interested in this new system called OpenRC to help replace some of the uh, service management systems on FreeBSD. Chris and I had been looking at a lot of alternative service management systems like NoSH, LaunchD, um, oh, there was one or two other ones as well. We, we'd been evaluating them for a while, trying to find something to help make things boot up faster and easier to manage. So when Joe Maloney came by and he's like, yeah, I actually have a build of OpenRC on FreeBSD over here, we were very interested and we started running some builds with it and testing it and toying with it for a while. So in 2016, early 2016, after we had been rolling these uh, current builds of FreeBSD for a few months, we decided that, okay, so much has actually changed underneath the hood from these rolling release builds to the release builds of PCBSD that the upgrade path was already completely shattered and broken. There was no way for somebody to go from a release of PCBSD, I think 10.3 or 10.2 was the last release of, free B or of PCBSD. And then we had these rolling release images, but there was no seamless upgrade path. It was a really complicated mix of hacks and manual commands, and it, it got ugly really, really fast trying to move to these new systems of package base and uh, OpenRC. So we decided that at that time, okay, so much has changed. We've ripped out so much of the old system that was there for PCBSD, and we've put in so many new subsystems. We didn't really feel right calling it the same thing anymore because we were also focusing from the TrueOS perspective on different systems. We weren't just doing desktop stuff anymore. We were now talking about configuring FreeBSD. We were tinkering with the FreeBSD underlying system itself. We were no longer just being a desktop built on FreeBSD, which was the point of PCBSD at the time. So we announced that the PCBSD project was ending and that the TrueOS project was the next evolution of it at, to take its place, much like a phoenix you know, rising from the, its own ashes. So that was the beginning of the TrueOS project in early 2016. And it really had a very different focus. First step is that it was consumer focused instead of desktop focused. So we weren't just doing a build of FreeBSD and then slapping a desktop on top, like KDE 4 was what we were using at the end of the PCBSD days. We were no longer just a desktop distribution. We were literally a customized version of FreeBSD, implementing a lot of changes in FreeBSD that FreeBSD, people who are following FreeBSD releases wouldn't have for another year or two, depending on when the next scheduled release was, because we were being based off the current branch of FreeBSD, not the release branch of FreeBSD. So our timetables were greatly accelerated from standard distributions of FreeBSD. We basically moved from a downstream consumer of FreeBSD releases, just using whatever FreeBSD gave us, and actually moved into an active tester and contributor back to FreeBSD, because we were providing FreeBSD developers users and people that were testing their changes very quickly after they were committed to FreeBSD head and providing active response right back to them so that they could get things, issues worked out and resolved well before the FreeBSD release process ever got kicked off. One of the other ways that we would do this is actually uh, merging uh, FreeBSD developer branches into base ahead of time if they got uh, bogged down in some kind of issue, either in Fabricator or something, um, we would actually merge those branches and work with that developer to get their changes put into uh, base ahead of time so that they could prove to the FreeBSD project, yes, it looks like it's a drastic change, but don't worry, it still does work very well. We have live builds, see, it, it works fine. So we would do stuff like that, and we were very instrumental, or I won't say exactly very instrumental, but we helped with that considerably with regarding the new graphics stacks for FreeBSD involving the newer Intel drivers and uh, DRM Next stuff. We were pulling those in and using that and providing feedback on that very, very early. 
So, okay, that's the end of the history of TrueOS. That kind of takes you from PCBSD up to TrueOS at the current time. Do you have any questions on history before I go into other additional differences from FreeBSD? Just showing how we kind of move from a desktop distribution of FreeBSD to basically a customized version of FreeBSD current. Uh, in the back. When you said you, you couldn't really upgrade from a rolling release, does that mean every time you wanted to upgrade, you'd have to wipe and repay it? No, no, no. So the problem was go switching trains, if you will. We couldn't go from the stable version to the rolling release version. Once you were on the rolling release version, you, were, we were, you could upgrade and stay on that fine, but there was a hard break between the two, and we couldn't find an easy and automated way of automating that. So that was a very clear logical break between the PCBSD days and the TrueOS days, as we can point to that because there really was no easy bridge. Yeah, yeah. That, it was a very clear defining moment for us. Yes? Yeah, uh, so it sounds like, like you're pushing stuff a lot faster than FreeBSD, pushing more stuff in quicker. Do yeah. you have any special methodologies to make sure that it wasn't breaking stuff? Unit testing? Of I'll get into that in just a second, yes. Okay. So, okay, yeah, that's just the general history. Let's go into a few more of the differences now of what's different now in TrueOS compared to FreeBSD. Because I've said FreeBSD current many times. Obviously, there's differences there between FreeBSD current and FreeBSD release. That's a given. But what does TrueOS add to FreeBSD current, and what do we do differently? Uh, first step, release engineering. Obviously, since we're based off of current, we're no longer following FreeBSD's release schedule. So we had to start providing, as a project, our own release engineering, our own release schedule. So we've tried many, many different types of schedules for releases among the PCBSD and TrueOS days, from you know, weekly rolling release images to monthly images to mixtures of you know, long-term support releases. And what we settled down on is actually one that works really, really well for us right now. And that is a six-month release, which we actually got the idea from OpenBSD. For any of you OpenBSD guys here, thank you. It was a great idea. Um, so that every six months, you get a stable release. That's what we call it on TrueOS. We have two branches. We have stable and we have unstable. So stable is a six-month release. Um, there are no changes to base or ports in that time unless there are like major security issues. That's actually why we issued the 1803 uh, release of TrueOS halfway through our six-month cycle in response to Spectre and Meltdown and stuff like that. It's significant enough we needed to push out another uh, release image ahead of time. Um, this, the reason we had something like this was this was perfect for derivative products or appliances. We had a lot of people that wanted to use TrueOS either on their servers or build their own little appliance off of it. But if you're having weekly updates to it, that's very, very disruptive to end users, specifically uh, enterprise users that expect it to be like a static appliance. They don't want it to change. So why does it keep trying to automatically change things? So stable releases were perfect for that, because six months is a long enough period of time that it's still easy to support it for us, because we're a much smaller team than FreeBSD. It gives us a smaller window. It's like, OK, yes, we'll support that stable version for six months. And then it's also long enough for the end user, because it's like, OK, once I install it, I don't have to worry about it for six months. Unstable branch of TrueOS is much more of our rolling release branch. So this is where we've released much, much more faster. We would do it sometimes once a week. We tried to shoot for once a month, but we weren't necessarily on a fixed schedule. So we told people it could be anywhere from every week to you know, every month for a new image of unstable. But what was unique about unstable was that it was the combination of unstable base and unstable ports. So if you wanted the new applications and stuff, we kept telling people you have to go to unstable. That's where we do all the new builds and stuff like that. But the unintended consequence of that was that you were also getting all the new base bits from FreeBSD Current at the time. So both of them were rolling in sync at all times. All right. Any questions about release engineering before I move on? So this is what TrueOS is using right now. We still have these, this, this is our schedule, and this is our release engineering. Um, as part of our release engineering process, we have quality assurance processes. We actually have fully automated build systems running all the time, and as part of that, we actually have a bunch of QA procedures built into it as well. So we try to catch things when building the full ports tree, for instance. We have a list of what we call essential packages to basically f alert us if one of our automated builds 
one of these packages fails to build, it's like, okay, something's going on in the ports tree right now. When all the flavors for Python got put in, needless to say, we were getting lots of alerts <laughs> from our build system because Python 2 and Python 3 were some of our critical ports and things were no longer failing to build, were failing to build for quite a while. So we have things like Python, Clang. Um, because we do have the desktop side of TrueOS, we add things like Firefox into there and a few of the other browsers, Chromium. So that, again, if some, one of those doesn't build, we consider that a bad ports tree. And then we have to work on the ports tree and then trigger another build until we can get a good ports tree, a good build, before we would consider releasing it. Uh, by the same token, we also check things from base. So bootability with uh, the latest FreeBSD base, we would check the bootloader. Um, we would check all the base packages and make sure that we could update between one set of base packages to another set of base packages. Since it was still highly experimental from FreeBSD itself, we did a lot of checks there. Plus, we did a lot of manual checks. So we would always install many times either into VirtualBox instances, onto laptops, onto desktops. We would try to manually install and test these images in several places before we would issue a new set of updates as well so that we could get, actually get the hands-on test. That's where we would find out, for instance, if, oh, yeah, the driver is there. It, like, for instance, the NVIDIA driver. It's there, it built, but oh wait, uh, NVIDIA in added another version of their driver and the latest driver now drops support for all these cards, so we need to try and detect and fall back to you know, older versions of the NVIDIA driver for particular systems and you know, things to watch out for. That's, where, that's the phase where we would have noticed things like that because we were actually running it on physical hardware and we ran into some of those things. Make sure that networking works in various types of situations, check that removable devices are working, things like that. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, you're you're the same, specifically saying, well, this package is, you know, it's not just every package. Yeah. Uh, so you're doing, you're checking to see if it compiles, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but you're going further, you're actually eyeballing and making sure it does what it's supposed to do. The automated checks is mainly just for builds. Does it compile? Do we get a, a package out of it? Using, like, the new versions of Clang and things like that, that was not actually running it. Running it would be would be part of the manual test where we'd actually physically install and run a whole lot of things. Yeah. Do it for every package. Why why pick certain ones? Um, mainly because we tried to pick uh, certain packages as like bellwether packages for entire systems of the ports tree, because if you try to wait until every package from the ports tree builds, um, we're never going to have a release. At any given time, there's always stuff. So you'd have a list of the ones that didn't compile. Yes. Exactly, and we do have those lists afterwards, but the, odd, the list of packages that we have would be what sends us the alerts as to whether or not it requires manual interaction to go through and fix the ports tree, or if, okay, this at least passes the smell test, then we'll go through and look at the lists so of other ones. It, it yeah. does everything on a, on a rolling basis constantly. On yeah. Exactly. So FreeBSD ports already has a bunch of smell tests like that and checks for automated systems like that. This wasn't necessarily to alert developers that their port is broken because FreeBSD ports team is already handling that and does regular builds like that. This is more from our side for a release engineering. It's like we cannot release if these 50 packages are not available. So those would be, again, our critical bellwether packages. If some minor you know, library package on the side was failing to build, OK, it's nice, but nobody's complaining. We, it's not considered critical to our use case. So, And we would take requests for new essential packages and things to add to the list. So it's grown over time as more and more people have requested things. Yes? When you say you come across like graphics drivers, like mm -hmm. versus NVIDIA drivers, that happens to drop an older card, yeah. do you then have to come up with a decision, do we want to drop that older card to support ours? No. So when I talk about the NVIDIA driver in particular, this has happened a few times with the NVIDIA driver. Their NVIDIA driver port is always just the latest driver from NVIDIA. But every so often, NVIDIA drops and creates a new legacy driver. So they have the 304 driver, the 340 driver, and then the current one right now I think is 390 or something, but that one's still rolling with whatever the latest is. Every so often when they create a new legacy driver, people that had the latest in driver installed will still, when they upgrade, they'll still get the latest driver, but that driver might not be 
it might not have the same support as the new legacy driver, and they actually need to roll over to the legacy driver instead. So you actually have to do a quick check to say, OK, um, usually we can't automatically convert people like that, but we can at least warn people of it ahead of time, saying, hey, uh, this driver might not work. If you're having any graphics issues, run this one command to replace the latest driver with the new legacy driver. So we've had to do that a few times. But it, it lets us catch things like that and at least warn people ahead of time. And we do include multiple versions of the yes. driver installed. Yeah, a, a package repo will have all the versions of the drivers, but you have to actually you know, replace one of the drivers with the other one when, with your packages, because the upgrade can't do it seamlessly. All right, service management. I already mentioned OpenRC a little bit. So this is one of the other big changes that we have been championing and pushing for FreeBSD is that we should use OpenRC as a replacement for the RC.D system in FreeBSD. Because it is a state-aware management of services, you can actually get statuses of all your services rather than the RC.D system where only a handful of the services would actually report whether they were running or not. Most of them just return errors if you ask for status, even though they might be running just fine. Uh, proper dependency handling of services. One of the things about OpenRC was that you can say, OK, yeah, I want to turn on this service at boot, but then the service says inside of it, oh, by the way, I need this, these other two services. You don't have to manually go read the documentation and figure out, it's like, OK, so if I want to turn this one on, I also have to turn this one and this one on. OpenRC is really good about that and says, oh, you turn this one on, but it says it needs these. Those are also available, so it'll start them up beforehand so that the one you want does work without having to do a lot of hand-holding um, or without having to do a lot of manual uh, reading and configuring. And then the other thing that we got as a side effect is that OpenRC really is the next generation of RC. It's the same kind of system, same methodology, but it's written as a C binary with shell-like service files. So you just get much faster operations. So the boot times went drastically down. And we got a lot of other, other uh, benefits from switching to OpenRC at that time. And we're actually still pushing towards uh, FreeBSD and trying to get uh, FreeBSD to move over to this. This is one of the things that we have been trying to champion for FreeBSD current, saying, hey, you might want to consider switching to this. It will restart services. OpenRC actually has two different types of service management. The standard start-stop daemon is very similar to FreeBSD's. It starts it, and if it stops, it stops. But at least you get warnings now of when you check the status, it says, oh, yeah, that service crashed. There's an additional type of uh, supervisor within OpenRC called supervised, uh, supervised daemon, where what it will do is if the service specifically says, I am supervised, it will launch it. But if it ever crashes, it will automatically restart it but then it will keep a counter of when was the last time this service was started and how many crashes has it had since it was manually started. So if you just do an RC status to see the status of all your services, you might see something that says, OK, that, you know, there's the times of all the services. And then some of them will have a parenthesis with like five inside of it. This has crashed five times and been restarted five times automatically. It gives you an idea that, OK, you might want to go check on that. Yes? Yes, it, it's, it's one flag within the service file. It's really easy to switch back and forth, yeah. And that's why I said it's on a service by service basis. So some of them might be supervised, some of them might not. Just depends on what you want. All right, one of the other changes that uh, TrueOS has, we have a very, very different rules of conduct. I know this is something that came up recently and I was asked to put this in here and I think a lot of people care, but really, we don't care. All we care about is the code. That's what it comes down to. As long as you can behave civilly and send in code, that's all we care about. Other than that, go your own way. That's our rules of conduct. In addition, our contributor policies are a little bit different in that we are completely GitHub-based. We do not use SVN. We actually use GitHub for everything. All of, our public, all of our pull requests and reviews and merges are all completely public, and anybody could go back and look through them and view them very easily. That's just like most other things, like S subversion stuff. But with GitHub, it just makes it really, really transparent and easy for anybody to browse it and search that really quickly. It streamlines the submission process considerably. Literally, for all you need, need in order to send in a patch to the TrueOS project is a web browser. 
you can go to our repo, you can find the file, edit the file directly there within your web browser, open a pull request in three clicks, and you can be done and send in a patch in literally you know, 10 minutes or less, depending on the size of the patch, obviously. Um, we also have a one-week timeout on patches. And by this, what I mean is if nobody has, if the maintainer or reviewer times out after a week, after a pull request has been sitting there, and there's been no objections to the patch or whatever, then one of the TrueOS developers will review it at the end of that week and just commit it or deny it right there by fiat, no questions asked. We, no, we do not have pull requests or patches that sit in limbo for a year or two. Everything is dealt with and handled on a very responsive basis. So that is one of our things that we are very, very passionate about. If you have a change and you send in a change, we will respond to you in a very timely basis. Most of the pull requests, you will get a response or get it merged in within a day or two. That's typically our process. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of happens, especially as the projects get bigger. So we put this in place really early with our system on GitHub, and we've been very strict about holding to this kind of timeout because we don't want to let PRs back up. We don't want to let issues continue to back up. So, I mean, feature requests and stuff, that's separate than sending a PR. If you have a patch and you send that in, that will be dealt with instantly. Now, just somebody asking, hey, I want this, why don't you do this for me? Yeah, that might sit for a while, <laughs> depending on if somebody wants to get around to it. That's different than actually somebody sending in code. Uh, package management updates. I mentioned that we do have base packages in addition to what I call ports packages, because it's not just packages, they're, they're packages from the port tree. Um, so we have package set up with two repositories, one for base, one for packages, so that we can update one or both simultaneously as need be. So the base package repo, for those of you that aren't aware, um, this will contain the package files for things like installing the FreeBSD kernel, uh, runtime packages, things like send mail, uh, the dash devel, um, those are the development symbol files for each of the individual packages and all sorts of other ones. So it's basically broken up. I think there's 120 different packages within the base package repo. That's how it breaks down. And then we have the ports packages. The other thing is that PC Update Manager. Again, FreeBSD doesn't use base packages right now. You can't use the exact same methods that FreeBSD does in order to update your system because the, up, the back end is completely different with the base packages. So in PC Update Manager, what we quickly discovered is that we needed an update script. PC Update Manager is written completely in shell. But it self-bootstraps itself, and this is really important because it gives us a mechanism whereby when we're doing a release and we have everything staged and ready, if we find an issue actually performing the upgrades on our test systems, we don't have to completely rebuild all of the release packages again and all the ISOs and everything. All we have to do is patch PC Update Manager because when it runs, it will self-bootstrap itself to the latest version to make sure that you have the patches for that update. So that lets us get a very, very quick turnaround to fix any type of update issues without having to issue completely new package sets, all 60 gigabytes of packages from the ports tree. So we discovered that very early, that we needed a mechanism like that just to fix and resolve issues like that on a very timely basis, because problems with updates are something that are a killer for distributions and stuff. If you can't update properly, then you're going to have a lot of troubles. So that's where we are with TrueOS right now. Do you have any questions on that before I uh, take us to the new stuff? Yes? Uh, how well does it operate under Zen? Under Zen? Have <laughs> I haven't tried it under Zen. I actually don't try as much of the virtualization stuff. We use a lot of uh, VirtualBox and VMware and Beehive. Zen, I know some people use it, but I haven't heard them complaining, so it might work perfectly fine. I just don't know. I just don't use it. Yeah. Yes? Uh, what's the status of TrueOS Pico? TrueOS Pico is a project that Chris developed, which is pretty much a static image for the Raspberry Pi itself. But he kind of got sidetracked after getting promoted to VP of engineering at IX Systems and hasn't had as much time to work on that. <laughs> 
So it's still there, and what's there works. We haven't gone through and disabled it, but it's still limited to the Raspberry Pi 2. He hasn't created the new images for Raspberry Pi 3 and some of the other boards. Can I talk to him if I have questions? Yes. Please talk to him if you have questions. Questions? Yes. You mentioned everything you do is on GitHub and all mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. So it's been, I think some people may worry, OK, this is a commercial product. But is there secret sauce, binary bits that you don't share? No. Everything that TrueOS has, we have no private repositories. We have completely public repositories. We don't have any closed source bits that we dump in or whatever. It literally is FreeBSD just taken to the next level, still completely transparent and open source. Any other questions about TrueOS as is? Yes? IX Systems is the owner slash sponsor of TrueOS. So back in the PCBSD days, Chris started the project by himself, and then he was purchased by IX Systems so that it became a part of IX Systems, and he was hired to continue working on the project. So effectively, it got folded into IX Systems. So IX Systems is officially like owning it and sponsoring it, and they're the ones that are creating all the build servers and running the tests, and many of the IX Systems employees are paid to work on this, and there's a lot of development effort put into it. Yes? Is TrueOS true used within IX Systems? All over the place. <laughs> yes. Other questions? All right. Well, let's go on. OK, so that's where we are right now with TrueOS, or I should say two months ago with TrueOS. <laughs> so what's going on with TrueOS right now? We just had an announcement uh, a couple days ago about a shift in direction for TrueOS, and that's kind of what I want to talk to here. So TrueOS is changing. We announced a couple days ago that TrueOS is growing into a distribution platform for anybody to easily build their own custom distribution of FreeBSD or TrueOS with just a couple quick commands. So it is a full-blown, I think Chris is using the term downstream fork of FreeBSD. So that repo there, if you go to the github.com TrueOS TrueOS repo, just like FreeBSD has their FreeBSD slash FreeBSD repo, um, the readme on that repository, if you just scroll down to the bottom, will give you a long list of changes from FreeBSD, some of which I have listed here. One of them, OpenRC. I've already mentioned that. We've been using it for a while, and that's one of the differences from FreeBSD at the moment. Uh, package, Poudre, and the root NSS certificates are all built into the base operating system itself. You no longer have to worry about package changing versions in the middle of an update because the release cycles are so much faster than FreeBSD. We can stabilize package for a, a few months at a time and then only roll out updated versions of packages with those release cycles. Um, the root NSS certs, because I believe the note Chris put on that in the readme was because not being able to use HTTPS initially is just dumb. I think that's basically what he said. So you get HTTPS support and encryption support out of box. Um, and then Poudrier. So one of the things that is specific to this to turn it into a distribution platform is the build system of it itself has now been collapsed down to a single JSON configuration file. We call it a build manifest that you supply to the build, and it will build all of the base, all of the ports packages, create the package repositories for you, as well as apply any of your custom install overlays, build overlays, build configuration changes. It's basically the one file to rule them all. And you can literally build your own distribution of FreeBSD. I think it's three commands. We fetch the repo, give it the manifest, and then run make build world, build kernel, make build packages, make release. And that's it. And that does everything. It generates, it signs all your packages, does the whole nine yards. So that's what we are going. So this would help, will help uh, downstream consumers of TrueOS to very easily customize and build their own appliances with just the individual packages they need, but might not be pointing to the TrueOS package repositories anymore. So that they can stabilize and do their own updates on their own schedule instead of being fixed by what we decide to do at the TrueOS project. It gives the freedom to everybody. But we're going to continue to release and update our own package repositories on the fixed schedules like we always have as well. So again, it's more freedom for all of our users. In addition to that, we're also changing the organization of the project a bit. 
the desktop side of TrueOS, which again was kind of uh, minimized a little bit with the change to TrueOS because we were focusing more on changing the base system, is actually getting split off as a new desktop-based distribution of TrueOS called Project Trident. This is a completely separate project. It is community-based and community-owned. And it is going to be something completely do, new as a distribution of TrueOS. Similarly, GhostBSD is going to become a desktop distribution of TrueOS, rather than following the FreeBSD releases as well. And then along with the system, we anticipate that we'll have many more new distributions of TrueOS to announce in the near future based from either corporate products or other uh, user products or community projects as well. And that's literally all I had. So uh, with regards to the split of the project, I am actually taking the lead and running Project Trident as well. So we do have a website that we just put up. But Chris, since me and Chris have kind of historically done the entire thing together, he's going to focus on the base stuff and head up TrueOS within IX Systems, and then I'm going to head up Project Trident within the community. Yes? Uh, so, so Trident and Go, they're, they're both desktop uh, systems. Yes. Why, why the split? What's the difference between them? Uh, GhostBSD has actually been around for quite a while as a distribution of FreeBSD, specifically focusing on the Mate and XFCE desktops. Yes. That's Eric Turgid there. He's the, um, he runs GhostBSD. Yeah. He created it. So it's kind of an analog to PCBSD. PCBSD was KDE focused. Uh, GhostBSD was GTK and Mate and GNOME focused. Although not GNOME anymore. It's Mate, Mate and XFCE. So it's just different, similar ideas, but just different ways using different tools and stuff. So GhostBSD, what's, what's your latest release for GhostBSD? Uh, 11.1, based on FreeBSD 11.1. Okay. There you go. <laughs> so, yes, in the back, sorry. Are you keeping true server? What was that? Is true server going to remain a product? Yes, so one of the things is because we're spinning off the desktop side to Project Trident, what we're doing is we're trying to take the TrueOS repository and take it much, much closer to FreeBSD. Aside from the changes I listed there, I mean, we've always had questions from people on the FreeBSD side who didn't want to take changes from TrueOS because they were worried about getting desktop bits. And it's like, no, no, no. It's like we've been focusing on the underlying systems, and no, there's nothing desktop there, but we're formalizing that a lot more. So that TrueOS will probably move to server-focused releases and leave the desktop-focused releases to Project Trident. So we've historically had both server and desktop releases for TrueOS for the last two years. But people still tend to say, oh, that's just a desktop, when no, it's, it's, it's a variation of FreeBSD. So we're just kind of formalizing that so that TrueOS is known as the underlying system. It is a server, or you can redistribute it as a desktop. Yes? I'm curious what the relationship between TrueOS and FreeNAS are in terms of their code base and how much <laughs> shared development is. <laughs> uh, FreeNAS is also an IX Systems project. Uh, TrueNAS is based off of it. FreeNAS is based off of FreeBSD. And it is not based off of FreeBSD releases as much as it is based off of free, FreeBSD stable branches. Because once again, releases are too slow, so they follow the stable branches. And there has been a lot of duplication of effort to try and keep that base up to sync by the same token, TrueOS, and the other projects trying to, again, keep their base up to sync with uh, FreeBSD with whichever branch they're following. We are currently evaluating within IX systems whether FreeNAS can move to TrueOS, and we're doing prototypes. Other than that, we'll wait and see, see what comes of it. Oh, over here. Yes, so I actually am the author of the Lumina desktop, and that's one of the things that we're going to do within Project Trident. So Tr Project Trident is going to continue following the same tact that TrueOS desktop side 
has been doing for a while, which is Lumina desktop, it uses the Lumina desktop by default, but then it also emphasizes and tries to create a much more pure BSD system instead of relying on a lot of the uh, Linux subsystems like Pulse Audio and stuff. We're actually going to try and do a lot more of that within Project Trident to keep it pure to FreeBSD and help enhance development within the FreeBSD community. That's one of our goals. Other questions? Yes, back there. Now, you were saying you can port uh, through OS mm -hmm. forward. Say I want to do that for my appliance, make the changes that I need. How easy is it to then pull in your changes from the next release into mine? Very easy. Um, actually, have you, have you used GitHub all that much before? A little bit? GitHub makes forking and then sending changes back and forth between forks incredibly easy. All right, so you can literally just fork our stuff at a particular tag. We're actually doing very smart tags of the different uh, builds and versions of the source tree on GitHub as well. So you can specify, okay, I want to fork TrueOS at release tag, whatever it is, blah. It could be an official release or it could be one of the intermediate development releases. It's up to you. Um, do your builds and then on, literally on your thing say, okay, now I want to re-merge or re-sync with the upstream fork and do all that and then you just might have to deal with merge conflicts for changes that you have to deal with yourself, but it's very, very easy to keep that up to date. That's actually how TrueOS has been maintaining its fork of FreeBSD for a long time because we re-sync with the FreeBSD repositories on a very frequent basis as well. And actually on the TrueOS, TrueOS GitHub repository, in the very top of the readme is the tag with the latest date that they have synced with FreeBSD head. So that we keep up to date, so as changes are getting put into FreeBSD, they will also end up in TrueOS. And then by the same token, we're hoping to help push more stuff from TrueOS into FreeBSD as we provide the testing platform for FreeBSD developers to test and approve changes and stuff. Trying to help make it easier every way around. Yeah. Uh, yes? How does uh, IX Systems justify the cost of TrueOS and Project Trident development? Uh, IX Systems is sponsoring Project Trident. They're actually the first sponsor in helping us get, a, get everything spun up and going. Um, but IX Systems has always looked at it, ever since the PCBSD days, as really a goodwill gesture and an R&D for a lot of the other mechanisms within IX Systems. Because all the products within IX Systems are based off FreeBSD, it was very helpful to have a small team on the PCBSD side of things constantly pushing the boundaries and trying new things and developing new technologies. So it was that plus Marketing, we go to conferences, we talk about IX Systems. <laughs> also, there's all sorts of benefits like that. I'm sure if you talk to different people at IX Systems, you'll get different answers from every single one, but that's the, that's the one I've always seen and heard. Yes? Um, is there a plan to unify TrueOS and the BSD community? Or? No, I don't think there are any plans to unify the communities. I mean, GhostBSD is a separate standalone project. I don't see any need for them to like shut down their forums and tell all their users to move to TrueOS. So, like coming under Trident. Yeah, so it, pretty much every distribution of TrueOS is that they can do that however they want. They can run their own forums. They can have their own communities. It's it's up to them. So we don't do any. We don't enforce any kind of give back from our distributions. So, is that a good answer? Yeah, that's yeah. a Because, I mean, there's been some talk because of Project Trident's a little bit more of a special case because it really is the continuation of the TrueOS desktop. So, we'll probably have some overlap on the TrueOS forums with Project Trident, at least for a while. But I don't know if the plan is to eventually start up a new forum or whatever for Project Trident. We just haven't worked out those details yet. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, under that name, we are skip planning for our first release to come in about two months. So we have scheduled for one more final release of TrueOS, because we've been promising people an 1806 release of TrueOS itself for a while now. We're going to stick to that promise. We will release TrueOS 1806. And then Project Trident will be releasing its own version probably two months. The first version will probably be two months after 1806 using the new systems and based off of that. One of the other changes with Project Trident, you know how I mentioned the release schedules for TrueOS? There was stable and unstable. 
With Project Trident, we're planning on only having one pack release schedule, and that is a stable base operating system, the stable version of TrueOS, but then we're going to have a rolling ports tree packages. So you'll have atomic diffs for end user applications during a release cycle, and then we'll only update the actual base OS packages every six months. That's our, that's our plan for Trident. Again, we'll see how it goes. We're, tr we're trying to keep it coy for the first time and make sure that things actually flow smoothly before we firmly commit ourselves to dates. But that's what we're thinking of. Right. Yes? So if you run into a, the, you know, the, I'm not running it yet, I'm planning on doing so, I'm going to try it. If I have true OS and then try to try it, is it an easy transition? Yes, we actually have planned a full upgrade path directly from TrueOS to Project Trident. We actually have within the TrueOS project right now, we have two different meta packages that we install. One of them is TrueOS-Desktop, and the other one is TrueOS-Server. So obviously, if you if, during the upgrade, if you have TrueOS-Server installed, OK, it'll keep you on the TrueOS repositories and keep going with that. That's, that's an easy transition. Um, we had talked about looking, and if the TrueOS-Desktop package is there, it'll just immediately upgrade you to Project Trident. But then there's a few people that are also wanting, it's like, okay, if that's there, maybe give people the option to upgrade to Trident or upgrade to GhostBSD. So we're looking into possibilities. Maybe we'll have some kind of switch down the road, but none of that's been finalized yet. Any other questions? I guess I'd clarify a little bit. Yes. Yes. And you use that word fork, and people. Chris use uses that fork, al that word a lot. I don't like that word. This is going to be like OpenBSD splitting. Yes. But I guess your understanding is. He, he's used the term fork there. He uses the term downstream fork quite a bit in conversation with him and stuff. He's trying to make it across that, yes, it is different from FreeBSD. But no, it is not separate from FreeBSD. We are still very much joined together. We are still sending changes to them on occasion. We are still getting changes from them on periodically on occasion. We try to keep in close with the FreeBSD community. It's not like we're trying to say, oh, you know, so long we're going to do our own thing. It's, it, it's not a fork like that. So it's, I guess we just haven't found the right terms to describe it. But yeah, that's basically what it is. And it seemed to be like you were hoping to track Yes. Mm -hmm. And again, some of the changes that we've got from FreeBSD right now, we're again working with FreeBSD people to get those into FreeBSD. With OpenRC, for instance, we would love to help FreeBSD move to OpenRC. Uh, base packages. This is something that a lot of FreeBSD people have been wanting for a while. It still hasn't been rolled out or implemented yet, but we're just a great test case of it can be done. Here's the fixes and patches we've had to do to get it working. And we're working with them so that FreeBSD can use package base as well. So we're trying to, even though we've got a bunch of diffs between us and FreeBSD now, we're actually hoping that will get shorter over time. And then maybe again, it'll get longer when we start you know, working on some other new thing that FreeBSD might need. And, We'll work on it and get it up and going, and then send that to FreeBSD again and try to sync it in, which is, yeah. <laughs> Hard to describe, but we, yes, we are very connected to FreeBSD, and we want to stay connected to FreeBSD. We don't want to just say, you know, so long and, you know, be our own thing. Yes? What's the support model for Are you talking, what type of support are you talking about? Yes and no. Okay. It's actually a community offering by a commercial provider. So IX Systems does not actually sell support plans for TrueOS. Okay. So it is all still just community support. Yeah. Yes. And so a lot of the IX people, like the FreeNAS developers and stuff, they'll off, will often, you know, within the TrueOS community, if people have really advanced ZFS questions, we'll say, hey, go ask on the FreeNAS forums, or maybe we'll get a FreeNAS developer over here and answer your questions over here, because they go into such more detail on ZFS and the storage side that we might never do. But we have so many pools of experts all over the place, each of them focused on various parts of FreeBSD, that we kind of see our, I, I kind of see TrueOS as kind of like a melting pot of that and the glue to help bring people into FreeBSD via TrueOS and then help them find all the communities and get hooked into everywhere and become part of the community.
Other questions? I don't know how much time we've got. I'm just guessing. We have 20 minutes. Oh. <laughs> Actually, 10 minutes. 10 minutes? Okay. Yes. Sure. Uh, planning to expand or to bring um, IX system to Europe. Bringing IX systems to Europe. You would actually have to talk to Chris about that and management. I'm, I am a lowly peon in the IX systems infrastructure. <laughs> Um, yeah, Chris is actually Vice President of Engineering, so he's involved in a lot more of those decisions. I'm just one of the engineers. Yes? So you mentioned OpenRC, fact-based, you know, you're sort of yes. giving yourself freedom to say, we're going to test bed some stuff. Yes. Are there things not in TrueOS that the, you would love to put into it, or that, you know, if, you, if you were king for a day? There's always ideas getting thrown around. Whether we actually start doing it or not is another matter, but that's the thing. With the computing world, it's always changing. So even though we might not have something in mind right now, you know, who's to say a year from now something really important doesn't come up? And it's like, you know what, that's a really good idea, and then we try to do something like that. We really don't know. We're leaving our options open. One of the things with PCBSD and TrueOS, we've always been very, very flexible and very reactive and very dynamic to what's going on in the ecosystem of Linux and BSD and pretty much all open source projects. So we try to keep that flexibility and just leave doors open so that we can start helping other projects and things do that. And that's one of the other reasons I wanted to bring up all these differences from FreeBSD. Just, it's not trying to trumpet TrueOS, but I mean, we're open. We want to talk to people. We want to help other distributions. We want to help NetBSD and OpenBSD. If what we have tried and didn't work is any example, maybe learn from our examples. It maybe a six-month release would work great for NetBSD or Dragonfly BSD. Maybe, you know, just learn from us. We're here to help everybody, whether you use our stuff or not. That was kind of actually the whole reason I put this talk together. It's like, okay, we've done a lot <laughs> over the last several years. Let's just tell people what we've done, what worked, what didn't work, and this is what we found that seems to work really, really well. Yeah, that would be the easiest one to adapt. In other ones, of course, individual technologies are on a you know case by case basis always. Exactly. And that's one of the reasons why we set up the distribution system for the new TrueOS repo the way we did, is we actually have the automation framework for doing it via Jenkins also baked into the repo. So we actually have a Jenkins setup file directly in that repo as well that anybody can take and distribute to distribute their own Jenkins instance to automate the creation of all the packages and stuff for them. So we're trying to do that to help you know, communities help people that want to start a distribution get up and running with as little effort as possible, rather than, again, expecting you to be a guru and know exactly which bits you need to flip here and there within the source trees in order to build a custom distribution. So, yes? Mm -hmm. But uh, I looked very quickly, and it seems to be uh, video driver only. What I mean by that, you get display 3D acceleration, stuff like that, but there's no uh, provision to support like uh, CUDA or OpenCL driver. Okay. Is there an easy path to get that on that platform? You want to answer that question? <laughs> From, well, from what I understand, they're actually looking at possibly giving us CUDA and stuff, but mainly because we were still behind from Linux, and most of that stuff was using Linux frameworks. Now that the DRM work has gotten in and they can use some of those, they're more open to turning on those bits in the proprietary NVIDIA drivers so that we can get CUDA support and stuff because the underlying systems are there for them now. Yeah. But 
Yeah, but we still need but we still need to wait for them. It's not necessarily in our hands. So if you want to talk to Nvidia and keep asking them for it, by all means, please do. OpenCL support and CUDA support would be fantastic in the Nvidia drivers. The driver has all the services from CUDA. Nvidia doesn't provide the user library. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any last questions? All right. Thank you very much. If you have any further questions, I'll be down here or at the uh, IX Systems booth if you want to talk anymore. Thank you.